All right, let's talk about CVP and hemodynamics and PAWP or pulmonary artery wedge pressure. So CVP, central venous pressure. Hemodynamics is just another word for blood pressure. Central venous pressure, this measurement is reflective of the pressure within the veins that drain into the superior vena cava. I'm talking about this blood vessel right here. You have a bunch of vessels that drain into the superior vena cava and a bunch of other small veins, the subclavian ones. And um, you have the jugular veins, the internal, the external jugular veins. All of those veins that take blood from the cephalic area and the upper extremities, they focus and they funnel all the blood to the superior vena cava. So normally what we do is we put a little catheter in one of those um, in one of those veins and then we smuggle it into the superior vena cava into the right atrium. And that's how we monitor the CVP. CVP is important because if somebody has fluid volume overload or right-sided heart failure issues, the blood will back up into those locations. And that's why we need to do CVP monitoring. Normal CVP is two to six millimeters of mercury. Um, I read that if you have heart failure, it's beyond 10. So just make sure you guys know that. So it's normal CVP, two to six. With this same catheter, we can measure the CVP of the right atria, which is in uniform with the central veins the right ventricle, and then we could put that bad boy right here in the pulmonary arteries. That's what that yellow delineation is demonstrating. And it's got a little balloon right here that inflates or deflates, depending on if we want to measure the pressure now. Now, CVP, pulmonary RO, and by the way, central venous pressure and right atrium, same thing, two to six millimeters of mercury. We could also measure the pulmonary artery pressure. Now, the AT, all these values are from ATI. So the ATI book says pulmonary artery during the systolic phase contraction, it's 15 to 28. In the same artery, but during the diastolic phase, it's a little bit less because the, that uh, diastolic is relaxation. So six to 15 millimeters of mercury. The pulmonary artery wedge pressure, you guys need to know that it is indirectly measuring the pressure within the left ventricle. That's what it's measuring. Even though it's pulmonary artery, I know it connects back to the right side of the heart, but this catheter indirectly measures the pressure within the left ventricle. And it should be between six to 15 millimeters of mercury. And then we go into some definitions. Cardiac output. This is the volume of that's coming out of your left ventricle um, every minute. And it's usually three to six liters per minute. SVO2 mixed venous blood is talking about the demand versus what we actually have. It's 60 to 80%. And then we have these things right here, preload and after. So right now I'm just defining these terms. Okay, guys. Preload is describing the amount of stretching that the right ventricle undergoes when blood is entering that location. Okay. The preload, again, if you have a large amount of fluid that's going inside the right ventricle, then your preload is hot. You have, it's stretching out. But if you're dehydrated, if you're someone who's, uh, who's losing fluids, then your preload is relatively low because it's not stretching out so much. The preload is directly related to the afterload because the afterload is talking about how much strain does my left ventricle have to exert to push out that blood systemically. That's the afterload. How much force does the left ventricle have to exert to go against the peripheral resistance and push that blood systemically? So if you have someone who has atherosclerotic plaque of the like peripheral artery disease, then your preload, your afterload, excuse me, your afterload is going to be high. It has to exert more force to push that blood out because of the peripheral resistance. So to illustrate that furthermore, imagine that this is the aorta. Let's say the blood's going this way. So you have a nice patent blood vessel. It's nice and open. Well, that's easy for the left ventricle to pump blood through because it's nice and open. The afterload is relatively low. But if you have that blood vessel and it's stenosed because of atherosclerotic plaque and there's limitations in its, in its lumen, well, now the left ventricle has to pump harder to get that blood through that narrow lumen. The afterload is high. So how do we fix this? Well, let's talk about preload. If you have a high preload, more volume filling up the ventricle, then your afterload is probably also going to be high. It has to push harder to push that blood out. How do you reduce the preload? You give diuretics. It, 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 it takes fluids out. Now the volume of blood that's going into that right ventricle, it's not that high. And what if your afterload is high? Your ventricle has to pump really hard to push blood through. How do you reduce afterload? You give, um, you give antihypertensives. They vasodilate the peripheral vessels. They open that vessel so it becomes easier for the left ventricle to pump blood through that vessel. So that's the main issue with preload and afterload. One more thing that I wanted to mention, um, the cardiac output. 
you compute that by getting your stroke volume, you multiply it by your heart rate, and then that gives you your cardiac output. Your stroke volume is the volume of blood that comes out of the left ventricle every pump, every stroke, you know what I mean? So hopefully that makes sense. And all these graphs right here, they're showing you how the pressure goes up and down with the um, monitoring of the graph. That's all it is. Notice that the right atrium, it's a little bit lower. Ventricle is always gonna be high. And then notice how it moves through the um, pulmonary artery and the uh, pulmonary artery wedge. Again, that's the one that's measuring the left ventricle indirectly. And this is an illustration of the pulmonary artery. These are the capillaries, and this is the pulmonary vein that goes back to the left atrium. That balloon goes and gets wedged in between one of the bifurcations of those vessels, and that's how it indirectly measures the pressure. So guys, make sure you memorize these values right here. 